the book of Psalms, and today we are in Psalm number 58, and we begin our study in verse 1, and Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth, in Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 58, verse 1. Do you indeed speak righteousness, O congregation? Do you judge uprightly, O you sons of men? And actually the psalmist here is talking to corrupt politicians. He's talking to corrupt officials. And that's why he asked if they speak righteousness in the congregation and they judge uprightly. He's talking to politicians and other civil authorities. And he says in verse 2, Yea, in heart you work wickedness. You weigh out the violence of your hands in the earth. So they were using their position to do evil. They devised wrong in their hearts. They exchanged justice for bribes. That is a dangerous thing to do, to devise wrong in our hearts. Devising wrong in our hearts is like priming a sinful pump because it is a very small step from nursing sinful thoughts to doing sinful things. Like the Bible says, as a person thinks in his heart, so is he. That's what Jesus says. Verse 3. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. Now, <clears throat> we are all sinners, but there are different degrees of sinners. And some are definitely worse than others. Now, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We all need a Savior. But some people definitely are worse than others. And God speaks of those who are bad when they are little, and they grow up to be evil. And, of course, God could change them. But they're full of self and full of evil. And they want no part of a God who promotes good. Verse 4. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf adder that stops its ear, which will not hearken to the voice of charmers, charming ever so wisely. They just won't listen, these people. And they just, they just are so hard-headed. They have no use for God at all. And, you know, you can, you can beat the hard-hearted. You can put them in prison. And they still won't turn to Christ. They don't care about what is good. And threats will not work with them. And they just get worse and worse. They are stubborn in their sin. They stop their ears to any call of repentance. 6. Break their teeth, O God, in their mouth. Break out the great teeth of the young lions, O Lord. <clears throat> so the writer, you know, is talking about these stubborn, hard-hearted, sinful, evil people who've been that way all their life and they have no interest in change. And so in verse 6 he is suggesting that since they don't have the capacity to do good, he asks God to at least take away their ability to do evil. In other words, if they won't repent, then God stop them from hurting others at least. 7. Let them melt away as waters which run continually. When he bends his bow to shoot his arrows, let them be as cut in pieces. As a snail who melts, let every one of them pass away. Like the untimely birth of a woman, 
that they may not see the sun. Before your pots can feel the burning thorns, he shall take them away as with a whirlwind, both living and in his wrath. Now, <clears throat> in those days, dry thorns were used as fuel for fast heat. They, they, were the, they were the microwave of the day. Because if you put thorns, dry thorns, under a pot, they would burn fast and they would burn very hot. They wouldn't burn long, but they would burn fast and hot. And so the lesson here is that God will kick up a storm of judgment fast and hot against the wicked who refuse to repent. 10. The righteous shall rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. God is using strong language to remove any doubts about justice prevailing and wrong being punished and right being rewarded. 11. So that a man shall say, Verily, there is a reward for the righteous. Verily, he is a God who judges in the earth. Some people ask, Why does God allow evil to win if he is a good God? And the answer to that question is, Evil will not win. It's true that evil is ahead. Today, evil is definitely ahead. But God hasn't even been up to bat yet. When the dust clears and it's all over, good people are going to say, evil didn't win. And it was worth it to play by God's rules. Psalm 59, deliver me from my enemies, O my God. Defend me from them that rise up against me. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity and save me from bloodthirsty men. God has not called his people to passive indifference. He has called us to an active prayer life because God works through prayer. Our prayers combined with God's power produce defeat for evil and victory for good. 3. For lo, they lie in wait for my soul. The mighty are gathered against me, not for my transgression, nor for my sin, O Lord. They run and prepare themselves apart from my fault. Awake to help me, and behold. David says, I didn't do anything to deserve this bad treatment. And he seems shocked. I didn't do anything to deserve this bad treatment. I don't know why. But Christians sometimes act surprised when those who don't care about God do not care about them either. When those who don't respect God don't respect them either. I don't know why we Christians are shocked at those sorts of things. We shouldn't be. Verse 5. You therefore, O Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to punish all the nations. Be not merciful to any wicked transgressors. Some people say, well, a good God would not punish people. A good God would not do something like that. No, the good God does punish sinners who will not change. And it's a good thing that he does, or the innocent would continue to suffer because of the things that evil people would continue to do. 6. They return at evening, they make a noise like a dog, and go around about the city. Dogs were despised back in those days. 
They were unclean scavengers. Nobody liked dogs. And dogs would roam around at night scavenging for something to eat. And if they couldn't find anything, they would let their displeasure be known by howling. So if you heard a howling dog at night, it was a hungry dog who couldn't find anything to eat. David's enemies were like dogs searching for him. But because God allowed David to slip away, they were like disappointed dogs howling. Verse 7. Behold, they bellow out with their mouths. Swords are in their lips. For who say they does hear? People who do not think that God hears them or watches them, and therefore they are not accountable to him, will most likely be nothing but trouble. And they're going to be in trouble. They're going to be trouble and they're going to be in trouble. Because whether they believe it or not, God does hear, God does see, and God does hold them accountable. Verse 8. But you, O Lord, shall laugh at them. You shall have all the nations in derision. God will have the last laugh. You know, some people, they are so intelligent. Some people are intelligent, and they are skilled. Unfortunately, they are also great schemers, and they use the God-given intelligence that they have to devise evil. They use it all to sin, rather than putting it to a constructive use. And we've probably all known people like this. I certainly have. <clears> the <throat> things are so smart. But God says he laughs at them. He knows what they will do before they even think about doing it. And they're not smart enough to get away with it. God will not overlook their sin. Verse 9, because of your strength will I wait upon you, for God is my witness. When things are bad, and they do not seem to be getting better, remember, God can do anything that he wants to do. If, the, if things are not getting any better, it is because God is not ready to let that happen for some reason. 10. The God of my mercy shall meet me. God shall let me see my desire upon my enemies. He says, the God of my mercy shall meet me. To meet God includes having your focus on God. Lesson. Focus on your trouble as little as you can. Focus on God as much as you can. When we keep God in our mind, we're less likely to panic over bad things. Which is a good thing. Because that will keep us from doing foolish things and making matters even worse. Verse 11. Slay them not, lest my people forget Excuse me, let my, yeah, slay them not lest my people forget. Scatter them by your power and bring them down, O Lord, our shield. He says, slay them not. He's talking about his people's enemies. And don't get rid of them completely. And that's because a living enemy, or another way to put it, a real, genuine problem is actually less of a spiritual threat to us than having everything go swell. A real problem is less of a spiritual threat to us than an indifferent attitude that lets its spiritual guard down because after all, everything seems to be going great. That's a real threat to our spiritual well-being. Twelve. For the sin of their mouth and the words of their lips, let them even be taken in their pride. And for the cursing and lying which they speak, consume them in wrath. Consume them that they may not be. And let them know that God rules in Jacob 
unto the ends of the earth. Sinners, blasphemers, whose filthy souls spill out in their ungodly words, will one day feel the wrath of Almighty God. And they will know that the Most High must be treated with reverence. And if he is not, then there's going to be trouble. 14. And at evening let them return, and let them make a noise like a dog, and go round about the city. Let them wander up and down for food, and growl if they are not satisfied. But I will sing of your power, yea, I will sing aloud of your mercy in the morning. For you have been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. The picture here is David's enemies, the dogs, howling because of their failure. And also, it's a picture of David praising God for getting him through another night. And there may be other lessons that we can pull from this, but I would suggest to you that one lesson is this. You're talking about David praising God for getting him through another night. Enjoy victories from God in bite-sized pizzas. Enjoy victories from God in bite-sized pieces. I'm saying thank God from keeping you from sin in the last 10 minutes. And then thank him again in another 10 minutes. Enjoy victories from God in bite-sized pieces. If you've been able to see in the last, you know, five minutes, thank God that you've been able to see. Thank God for supplying you with food and a place to sleep today. And then tomorrow, thank Him again. Enjoy victories from God in bite-sized pieces. Now we go into Psalm 60. Psalm 60, verse 1. O God, you have cast us off. You have scattered us. You have been displeased. O turn yourself to us again. To be rejected by God and feel it is bad. And that's what he's feeling. He says, you've cast us off, God. You have scattered us. You've been displeased. That's not a good feeling. To be rejected by God is bad, if you feel it. To be rejected by God and not even feel it, or care about it, that's much worse. Consequently, even though it doesn't feel good, we should be grateful when God lets us know that our sins have grieved Him. Because at least we can straighten things out by confession and repentance. The people that are in real trouble are those who can just go sin and sin and not even feel guilt about it. I wouldn't want to be in their shoes. Two, you have made the earth to tremble. And the earth there refers to the land of Israel. You have made the earth to tremble. You have broken it. Heal the breaches thereof, for it shakes. And it was in rough shape. Israel was a mess when this was written. King Saul was in charge. and He was a demon-possessed crackpot. King Saul was, you know, beyond the point of no return. He was so evil. He was even killing many priests. He was hunting God's chosen man, David, like a wild animal for years. And so at this point, ungodly men were running the country. And the Israelite army had just been defeated by the Philistines. The country was falling to pieces. Verse 3. You have, you have shown your people hard things. You have made us to drink the wine of astonishment. In other words, none of the bad that they were experiencing was by accident. It was all designed by God for a purpose. 
Bad times will bring good results for God's people if they will just hang in there with him. Verse 4. You have given a banner to them that fear you, that it may be displayed because of the truth. Selah. A banner would be a flag. And, and the Bible says here that God gave a flag to those who fear him. Back in those days, the bravest soldiers would carry their country's flag into battle. They were bold to identify themselves with their country, even in front of their enemy. And so they were often the target, but they didn't care because they were so committed, so dedicated. And the lesson here is this. This verse is saying that the more one fears God, the more bold they will be. And the more one fears God, the less they will fear man. 5. That your beloved may be delivered. Save with your right hand and hear me. The holy remnant of people were loved by God. And God saved the nation for the sake of a godly few. Every every one, even, or I should say it's even one godly person. Just one godly person can hold back a lot of trouble for a lot of people. Verse 6, God has spoken in his holiness. I will rejoice. I will divide Shechem and measure out the valley of Sukkoth. When God speaks victory, his voice prevails. The voice of trouble is sometimes loud and sometimes disturbing. But the voice of God is able to squash trouble if we pray. Verse 7, Gilead is mine and Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is a helmet for my head. Judah is my lawgiver. He says, Judah is my lawgiver, which means that out of the tribe of Judah in Israel will come God's lawgiver, will come his king. And that's talking about Jesus Christ. Jesus was from the tribe of Judah in Israel. Man's authority ends whenever they try to command someone to do something contrary to what God's lawgiver says is right. So man's authority ends when it contradicts what Jesus says. Verse 8. Moab is my washpot. Upon Edom will I cast out my shoe. Philistia, triumph you because of me. He says Moab is my washpot. Back then people poured water from a pitcher over their dirty feet and then beneath their feet they would catch the dirty water in a wash basin, in a wash pot. The country of Moab was famous for enticing God's people to sin. God says, they're going to be my wash pot. And here's the lesson. Those who entice God's people to sin will be used by God as his wash basin. What exactly that means, I have no idea. But it's one of those things that you don't have to know exactly the details of what he's talking about to know that it sure isn't good. Verse 9. Who will bring me into the strong city? Who will lead me into Edom? Will not you, O God, who had cast us off, and you, O God, who did not go out with our armies? Give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of man. Vain is the help of man. Now God may use things or people to help us, to bless us. God may use them. However, we shouldn't look to things or people for help. We shouldn't trust in those things or those people. Because if we do, we will learn that they are worthless 
apart from God's blessing. Worthless in the long run, for sure. Man's help is useless if it doesn't have God's backing. Verse 12, Through God we shall do valiantly, for he it is that shall tread down our enemies. Through God we shall do valiantly. We have to pray hard and then work hard in order to be fruitful. Pray hard and then do what you believe is best to the best of your ability. That's the kind of attitude that God blesses. Psalm 61, hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. In other words, no matter where I am, no matter how far away I may be, I will call out to you, God, when I'm in trouble. And, and that's one thing great about God, is that he's always at hand. Others may be too far away to help, but God never is. So that's why you can say, hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry. Because God is there with them. Even, even if he's at the end of the earth, wherever that is, God will be there with him. Three, for you have been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. A strong tower or a high tower was where you would go to get away from problems. In other words, a high tower would put you out of the reach of the enemy. And he says, God is my high tower. In other words, God is the best way I know to get away from it all and to get back on track and to get back to clear thinking. For I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. Notice what he says here. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. In God's tabernacle. It's like he's saying, I'm going to be a guest at your house forever. So he's asking God if he can be the Lord's guest forever. And there's a reason he asks that. Hospitality was a very important thing back in that culture. In those days, if you were showing true hospitality, that would mean that you would absolutely die before you would let anyone hurt your house guest. You would defend them to the end. Which is why, um, what's his name, Lot, defended those two angelic messengers who came to his house. Because that's just the way it was. You would die... You would, you would do whatever you had to do to defend them. So, he is asking God if he can be his house guest forever, which means he's asking God to die to protect him, if need be. And that, of course, is exactly what Jesus did. Verse 5, For you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those that fear your name. God reserves special privileges for those who fear him. You have heard my prayer. You have given me the heritage of those that fear your name. Special blessings on those who fear God. God does good things for all people. But eternal life and fellowship with him answers the prayer. Eternal security are only for those who fear him. Verse 6, You will prolong the king's life and his years as many generations. David is the king. So when he is praying for the king, he's praying for himself. He's, he's praying that God would add years to his life and he would pack into them the equivalent of many generations of blessings. He's not shy in what he's asking God to do. 
there, there are no limits to what God can do. So there's no point in, in being, uh, in restraining ourselves when it comes to our prayers. The sky's the limit. Verse 7. He shall abide before God forever. O prepare mercy and truth, which may preserve them, may preserve him. So will I sing praise unto your name forever, that I may daily perform my vows. He says, I will daily perform my vows. Dedication to God every single day is the best thing to vow to him. And it is the one thing that pleases him the most. You can't offer God anything more important to him than your complete dedication. And we stop there. We'll pick it up in Psalm 62 next time. Thanks for spending this time with me, studying the Word of God together. Until next time.